Welcome everyone. My name is Serhat Bur from Ege University, is in Turkey. Um, we are going to chair this introduction to Leon 2.0. Is there any tremendous change? We are really wondering, right? Rani, please go ahead and uh, introduce the first speaker. Well, thank you very much. And we're delighted to invite uh, Eduardo again <laughs> to give uh, the topic of validation of pH and impedance metrics in GER diagnosis, please. Thank you, Ronnie. And I have to apologize because some slides are overlapping with the other topic I had, but uh, I mean, the, the topics are so, were so close that uh, uh, it was impossible to me doing differently. I will present some outcome data about the metrics that can be measured with pH impedance, and so then we can discuss about that. These are my conflict of interest again. And this is the timeline with the landmarks in their assessment. And uh, I published it on Journal of Neurogastroenterology Motility after Ronnie suggested to do it. And uh, uh, we just summarized what the progress we did in terms of GERD assessment until the uh, Lyon consensus. As you know, the Lyon consensus emphasizes a little bit uh, what is uh, known now in terms of clinical history, proton pump inhibitor, trial endoscopy, and uh, histology, and of course, ambulatory pH monitoring, and uh, also adding some uh, additional insight about the use of HRM to confirm or corroborate the diagnosis of GERD in patients with uh, uh, difficult to treat patients. Uh, the uh, rationale behind the use of impedance pH reflux monitoring has been mentioned uh, yesterday, but also this morning and before we know that the PPR trial has shown limited ability to identify patients with GERD. The endoscopy has demonstrated poor sensitivity in diagnosing GERD, almost because every patient who came for doing an upper endoscopy took PPI for at least two, three, four, six months before doing the upper endoscopy. And the 24-hour pH testing has shown suboptimal sensitivity for GERD because day-to-day -day variability, because symptom reporting is not always so accurate. And indeed, the symptom reflux association sometimes may uh, lack of regulability. I already showed this slide before, and uh, uh, um, you know that uh, the pH impedance is able to measure also the weekly acidity, and therefore having uh, the full spectrum of uh, reflux um, happening in the esophagus, and so we may measure also the gas movement, and we can have the test done on PPI therapy. All these metrics are unfortunately impaired by the day-to-day -day variability, the short recording time, and also the catheter-related discomfort, as emphasized before by Ronnie in his comment. We also have the metrics, uh, the mean nocturnal baseline impedance, the PSPW, which are longitudinal marker, not affected by day-to-day -day variability, unfortunately affected by manual analysis, and uh, uh, is they are time-consuming. I will talk uh, about the reflux symptom association because anyway, this is, uh, uh, it, I mean, it's not uh, a metric, but this is something that can be measured with uh, uh, impedance pH testing and uh, is uh, um, improved by using impedance pH testing as compared to pH metry alone or Bravo pH capsule. We know from the first study by the Amsterdam group of uh, uh, Arian Bredener and uh, Andres Maut that impedance pH increased the diagnostic yield of the test as compared to pH alone. I already show you this slide with the uh, um, uh, diagnostic yield improved demonstrated by several groups, both off PPI and on PPI therapy, and in patients with uh, atypical symptoms like cough, as done by Daniel Sifrim and his group. Of course, symptom association analysis has to be validated by outcome study. And so uh, the question is, do we have data, outcome data, to say that they are good and they should measure in clinical practice? I mean, depending to whom we are asking uh, this question, probably someone would answer no. But, some, uh, but if we look a, a little bit more in uh, medical literature, we can find some data to sustain that symptom association analysis can be helpful in some patients. 
Uh, in patients with reflux hypersensitivity, we have this randomized control trial uh, selecting patients according to pH impedance to take citalopram neuromodulators. And the, uh, this Greek author showed that uh, uh, if uh, the patient are identified as a reflux hypersensitivity patient according to a pH impedance, they will go to respond better to neuromodulators as compared to patients not selected by pH impedance. We have other data, I mean, not so uh, good as the previous one, but also in this study, the use of pH impedance and the uh, evidence of reflux disease behind the syndromes show that uh, a patient could respond better to fluoxetine as compared to placebo in patients with a positive pH impedance testing. We have retrospective data provided by uh, Prakash Group in St. Louis, and uh, uh, they measure the uh, ability of pH impedance to predict uh, symptomatic outcome after medical and surgical therapy. We, you see here that distal mean nocturnal baseline impedance, but also symptom association probability can predict the response to both kinds of therapy. Going to uh, surgery, we have retrospective data. This was uh, uh, published by Marzio Frazzoni some years ago, about 10 years ago, on surgical endoscopy, showing that uh, uh, pH impedance done on and off therapy is able to identify patients who are going to respond to fund duplication. And also Frank Zerbi published a similar paper showing that uh, the symptom association probability uh, analyzed prior to surgery is able to predict the response to anti-reflux treatment. Going to randomized control trial medical therapy, we have this study, this study that uh, was published in 2022 by Jan Tak and his group uh, on the use of baclofen as add-on therapy in patient refractory to PPI therapy. Patient uh, underwent pH impedance prior to baclofen administration and they found uh, that uh, only patients refractory to PPI but with a positive a symptom association probability before uh, drug administration responded to baclofen therapy as add-on therapy. Reflux hypersensitivity, it, it seems not be a contraindication to Nissen fund duplication. This was shown in this retrospective study, but. Uh, limited sample size, I would like to uh, emphasize this, by the Amsterdam group. And also we have the uh, randomized control tri trial published on the New England Journal of Medicine in 2019. Again, here also the sample size is not as large as we would like to have, but anyway, they show that uh, fund application is better than placebo and is better than neuromodulators or baclofen in treating patient refractory to PPA and the positive pH impedance testing. As to the number of reflux episodes, unfortunately, we do not have a, um, a large amount of data. I believe that probably there is only really a one study that is very well done, and this is uh, uh, this has been well presented this morning with a 20-minute talk by Radu Tutuyan, so I don't have to go in detail about that. But uh, Prakash and his group analyzing uh, the, this data coming from a randomized control trial, this is a post-talk analysis, they show that uh, the number of reflux symptoms predict uh, the response to therapy and uh, uh, therefore should be a, a metric that can be uh, analyzed prior to therapy and also after therapy to understand if the patient is indeed cured or healed after links. The, uh, this is my personal opinion, what I'm saying now. Probably the lack of data about the role of a number of reflux episodes was due to the fact that uh, until uh, 2021, the uh, way to assess the number of reflux episodes was a little bit unclear. And uh, that's the reason why we reunioned in wing at Wingate at the Daniel facilities to uh, try to standardize the way to analyze reflux episode. And I believe that also with the publication of normal values, we will have some uh, additional metrics to study at least in research setting to understand if the number of reflux episodes can be used for predict any kind of response or to identify those patients who should be better treated with anti-reflux surgery links or endoscopic uh, anti-reflux procedure. 
As to mean nocturnal baseline impedance and PSPW, uh, some of these data have been showed uh, before, but also this morning by uh, Nicola de Bortoli. I would like just to emphasize this study, which correlate uh, um, both uh, MMBA and PSPW with response to uh, um, PPA therapy as compared to esophageal acid exposure. We found that uh, uh, MMBA particularly correlate better then uh, uh, esophageal acid exposure with response to PPI. And this study was also replicated later on on uh, the Journal of Neurogastroenterology Motility by this uh, um, Chinese group. Also, Daniel was part of this study, I believe. And uh, also, they found that baseline impedance correlate better than esophageal acid exposure with the response to uh, medical treatment of gastroesophageal reflux disease. Uh, the uh, correlation, the utility of MMBI in terms of predicting the response in patients not reporting symptoms during the testing day was demonstrated by a, a multicenter group led by uh, Prakash and Benjamin and uh, Harvin, uh, uh, two fellows of Prakash, showing in this study, in this large study, that patients who do not report symptoms during the testing day, but who have a low mean nocturnal baseline impedance are going to respond to uh, medical treatment for gastroesophageal reflux disease. And so although also in this patient, apparently measuring mean nocturnal baseline impedance is, does suffice to say that they are affected by GERD and they can respond to medical treatment. In a patient with atypical symptoms, we uh, demonstrate almost the same concept uh, in patient reporting atypical symptoms like chronic cough. We measure the pH impedance variable at the distal esophagus and also at proximal esophagus, showing that uh, indeed those patients who have low mean nocturnal basal impedance have more probability of responding to PPI therapy. And uh, um, another concept that I, I was just thinking about now, about the criticism that was done before, about the fact that the distal uh, mean nocturnal base line impedance may impair by stasis or uh, saliva and so on, we show that the correlation also with the baseline impedance at mid esophagus and proximal esophagus correlate quite well with the response to PPI. And the probability of having stasis in mid prox or, or in the proximal esophagus is much lower than in the distal esophagus. So I think that is uh, in the, an additional point to consider when to talk about uh, mean nocturnal baseline impedance. Uh, we have the data from uh, Chan. Uh, this is not the only, the only study they did about the role of this uh, of impedance pH in patients with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. There are some data also from other group. Also, we published uh, more than 10 years ago, unfortunately, and became hold. And uh, uh, we showed there is a, a clear correlation between the reflux burden as assessed by pH impedance and the probability of patients with high PF to uh, um, decline not only the lung function, but also to reduce the survival. And in this study that was just published on the American Journal of Gastroenterology, they show that also the new metrics uh, correlate quite well with lung function. We have um, outcome data also for MMBI and PSPW. This is uh, a large study with more than 200 patients enrolled who ha um, have, uh, um, uh, have been assessed by pH impedance and uh, divided according to response to PPI therapy. And we found that uh, uh, MMBI correlate quite well with response to PPI in patients with gastroesophageal reflux disease. The same was not true in patients with the reflux hypersensitivity and functional harbor that anyway were quite clearly identified by the test. So uh, we, are, we are quite confident that this works. Also um, confirming that the patient will not go to respond and the patient will go to response to therapy. And I already showed this study before, so I will not go in detail. I will spend a, a more time in talking about uh, gas movement and belching. This is a relevant uh, phenomenon that can be measured with pH impedance 
testing, we are able to uh, stratify patients according if they have aerophagia, gastric belching, a super gastric belching. This has to be done, uh, unfortunately, manually, and this a little bit uh, struggling for the uh, for who does the test, but it's uh, 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 quite evident based on Daniel Seifrin studies and also based on Arian Bredenov study that supergastric belching is one of the driver also of reflux disease. So if we know the mechanism by which the, reflux, uh, the gastroesophageal reflux occurs, maybe we can treat the mechanism and reduce the reflux burden without the need of medical treatment. Important is the uh, possibility provided by pH impedance also to understand that all the patients we have, also those with tree reflux disease, those with abnormal esophageal acid exposure, may have overlapping entities, which, is, which are reflux hypersensitivity and functional harbor. So maybe they can respond to PPI therapy because there you have the uh, complete normalization of esophageal acid exposure, but they can remain symptomatic. This patient can be clearly identified by pH impedance. These are patients with behavior disorder, and to induce symptom relief, we have to treat the behavior disorder. Like Daniel did with uh, this uh, elegant study published on the American Journal of Gastroenterology in 2018, where they showed the CBT was effective in treating at least 50% of the patients who were refractory to PPI treatment. Uh, another uh, concept that was raised uh, last weekend, DDW is the possibility to identify patients uh, who are uh, in, uh, unable to belch. Honestly, in my practice, it is a quite rare phenomenon, but uh, uh, it is described. The first one to describe the phenomenon was Peter Carillas a few years ago, just a few. <laughs> And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, there is this study uh, uh, which came out uh, 30 years later <laughs> showing that indeed there is a, a small group of patients who come to our motility lab that probably have this inability to belch and are symptomatic because of that. And if we are able to identify them by using uh, a concomitant high resolution manometry with impedance or using pH impedance, you see at the bottom of the slide the entrapment of the air during the test. Uh, if, you, if you treat this patient with Botox at upper esophageal sphincters, it seems that condition resolves. Okay. And finally, rumination syndrome is uh, another condition which requires the use of uh, impedance at least uh, uh, concomitantly with high resolution manometry in order to de define the uh, condition and uh, to treat accordingly by using biofeedback or, uh, I mean, there are data with uh, baclofen, also fund application. I, I prefer to use behavior uh, directed therapy for treating this patient, but there are also some data in medical literature with more aggressive therapy. These are my take-home messages. Uh, reflux testing with esophageal acid exposure and acid reflux symptom association analysis measurement has shown good, good reproducibility, uh, inter-observer agreement, and suboptimal sensitivity, but limited ability to predict the response to medical and sur or surgical therapy, particularly in difficult to treat patients, which who are those who, who have behavior disorder, borderline esophageal acid exposure, most of those who have negative endoscopy and so on. The use of full reflux symptom association analysis and novel, uh, novel, they are no more novel, impedance pH metrics might be useful to identify patients with GERD-related symptoms and to predict medical and, and surgical treatment and response in both patients with typical and atypical symptoms. The assessment of the total number of reflux events as a measure of EGJ impairment is a promising metric to evaluate the outcome from medical and surgical therapy, but we need more data in this regard. And air detection is indeed one of the uh, main advantage 
of impedance pH testing and is helpful to drive correct management of patients with Belching disorder. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, any questions? Uh, so while uh, we're thinking about questions, you haven't really uh, discussed the whole concept of weekly acidic reflux. That did not come up in your uh, presentation. Is, is this passe or this is something uh, that we need to uh, focus on, especially when it comes to patients that have an abnormal amount of uh, weekly acidic reflux and uh, we don't see any correlation with symptoms? Yeah, you know that uh, we are, uh, although we are able to correlate symptoms with weekly acidity, we are not able with the pH impedance, but also with the other tests to measure the volume of the reflux. That probably is critical to understand uh, the correlation with symptoms and so on. Unfortunately, this is not possible up to now, but I hope that if Daniel continues to work in this context, we will be able to do that and probably we will understand better how to um, correlate this with weekly acid reflux. Unfortunately, we have only surgical, surgical option for this patient, and surgery, uh, it, it is good. There are so many surgeons here, so I cannot say something different, but uh, uh, sometimes can be challenging. Roberto. Yeah, Eduardo, thank you very much. A fantastic talk. I, I would like to mention one more thing and ask your opinion. The fact that, in fact, a good clinical history and pH and impedance monitoring, according to some data of Daniel, can also give us a, a diagnosis of I, um, let's say, probability of the diagnosis of rumination, because he, he published both in uh, adults and children uh, this score of the number of weekly acidic reflux episodes in the hour after meals and also based on symptom index uh, during that period, which, uh, you know, correlates quite well with the clinical history and then with a uh, postprandial uh, high-resolution impedance manometry test. So that, that's, I mean, we, we should, in fact, become more expert in looking at pH and impedance. Yeah, yeah but uh, I mean, also John highlighted this this morning. I mean, clinical pictures sometimes tell you everything you need to know, <laughs> but sometimes you need objective demonstration of what you thought. So uh, it is something that uh, has to be done, particularly if you choose to move on with the more aggressive therapy, you, should, you need to demonstrate this in some way. So the clinical picture is crucial, but uh, objective demonstration of the condition is uh, somewhat uh, is relevant also. Thank you, Eduardo. We should move to the next Wonderful. one. Thank you. <laughs> now I would like to invite Prakash Gayawadi. Okay, he's here. You have already heard many of his studies. Now we are going. He's going to talk about the validation of esophageal motility in reflux diagnosis. Is that any validation? No. No. <laughs> okay. We're done. Okay. Thank you very no. much. You can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Sarhat and um, Rani. Um, I'm going to try to talk about the role of, uh, rather than try to validate it, the role of uh, manometric findings in the context of gastroesophageal reflux disease. And regardless of what the title says, do not use manometry to diagnose GERD on, 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 by itself. I don't think you can. So pathophysiology of reflux, we say, and, and I say this particularly to Daniel, TLESR. TLESR, main mechanism of reflux. But uh, you, you also have structural abnormalities at the EGJ and some element of esophageal motor uh, clearance that could be abnormal. You have downstream factors, you have upstream factors. So both hypomotility mechanisms and structural mechanisms combine to give you the uh, uh, situation of elevated esophageal reflux burden that we may, diagnose, may add to the diagnosis of reflux disease. So this is what a transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation looks like in manometry. Issue is, we don't measure it with manometry. So we use uh, acid reflux uh, exposure times and numbers of reflux episodes in pH impedance as a surrogate marker for transient LES relaxation. But what do we look at? Well, um, we look at uh, the uh, 
tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, or that's what we used to look at. And you, you can see that in patients who are res referred for anti-reflux surgery or patients with abnormal pH monitoring, the likelihood of having a hypotensive basal lower esophageal sphincter pressure is higher than in patients without reflux. But just having a low um, LES basal pressure does not automatically tell you that the reflux uh, burden is going to be abnormal. So let, let's, let's try to understand what we're talking about. This is the esophageal gastric junction. And you can see um, the intrinsic sphincter in between these diaphragmatic uh, crural contractions. If, if you're accustomed to looking at, uh, at uh, conventional waveforms, the respiratory mean so in other words, a respiratory minimum. In other words, the end expiratory pressure gives you the sphincter uh, pressure at rest. Um, the diaphragmatic um, crural uh, augmentation is not something that we've always looked at. And then the respiratory mean pressure, the basal LES pressure, is at the midpoint of inspiration or expiration. That's what we used to look at. But the, the, the newer metric, I, I'm, I will never forget the, the uh, analogy of the diamond mine. So uh, Sumit Mittal was the first person to uh, look at the vigor of the EGJ that takes into account not just the um, respiratory mean, but also the diaphragmatic crural augmentation in a metric that he called LESPI. It's now called the EGJ CI, or esophageal gastric junction contractile integral. And uh, uh, the first version of the Lyon classification actually had some recommendations on how to calculate this. It's calculated above the gastric baseline. There's um, little separation or no separation of the di uh, LES and the diaphragm. You take the whole EGJ unit as a single unit. If there is a significant separation, then you just look at the intrinsic lower esophageal sphincter. So type 3 EGJ, uh, you don't combine the two when you calculate the EGJ CI. So essentially, you're, you're looking at the vigor of the barrier over three respiratory cycles that takes into account the length um, and the amplitude, duration of uh, three respirations. The value is divided by the duration of three respirations to make it independent of time and it's uh, reported as millimeters mercury per centimeter. And it has modest correlation or predictability of acid burden. This was our study. This was uh, Tolone's study somewhere in the room. They looked at the EGJCI in predicting reflux burden. You can see the area under the curve in the 60s, the 0.6 or so. So not the best. That's not the only entity that is involved with reflux burden. And uh, a few years ago when we looked at this, this, these were the number of studies that had looked at a comparison of um, the EGJCI with patients with reflux disease with or without controls, with, with or without healthy controls. So some of these patients were non-reflux controls who were not really volunteers. And if you look at the range that you see here of patients with reflux disease, so if you look at the rows that say GERD, you see 18, 11, 50, 30, it's all over the place. It's all over the place. And it, how is that relevant? Again, my, my colors are a little off here. But um, if you look at the, uh, the pale box and you look at the circles, that is the fifth percentile value in healthy controls. So significant overlap with patients who are healthy volunteers, significant overlap. This is from uh, a cohort of over 400 healthy volunteers from 16 countries. So EGJ barrier metrics overlap between gastroesophageal reflux disease and healthy volunteers. So you cannot hinge your diagnosis just on how vigorous or how weak the EGJ is. Is it helpful? Yeah, maybe uh, as an adjunct, but not as a primary metric. What about morphology, the degree of separation between um, the LES and the diaphragmatic crura? You can see type 1 with the two overlap. I know Sumit had a different uh, classification, but type 2, uh, less than 3 centimeters separation. Type 3, uh, more than or equal to 3 centimeters separation, or the diaphragm is not traversed at all. So you just see the LES and not the diaphragm. This does associate with reflux burden. That's type 1. That's type 2. You can see the abnormal in blue here, proportion, type 3. So there is increasing reflux burden the, the greater the separation. Sumit showed this too. And the likelihood of finding these uh, separations, these profound separations, much higher in patients with reflux disease than in healthy controls. And it also turns out, this is Toloni's data, that manometry 
the degree of separation that you see on manometry, on high resolution manometry, correlates very well with the distance that you measure during laparoscopic surgery. So manometry is quite reliable in identifying separations. So EGJ morphology and acid exposure, you can see total and supine acid exposure going up as the degree of separation goes up. So type two is a small separation, type one is an intact EGJ, type three is three or more centimeter separation. But more importantly, there are more non-responders uh, to PPI the larger the separation. So in other words, it's a mechanical issue as the separation goes up. So when you look at morphology, that is relevant in your patient evaluation because the larger the separation, the less likely it is that you're gonna uh, be able to get a good response with acid suppression alone. So again, to, to, uh, to touch on this again, that is a, a non-separated EGJ. This is a persistent separation, and Sumit talked about this a little bit this morning, so intermittent separation. This is becoming more important now because our studies are long. You can thank Rena for that. So we have, uh, you start with the supine swallows, then multiple rapid swallows, then upright swallows, solid, whatever else you do, and then rapid drink challenge. So the study is so long that you may see a separation at one point in the study that may close at a later time. Rarely you may see no separation at the beginning, and when you, when you do one of these maneuvers, you see separation. And I think we saw that a little bit earlier today. Um, and uh, the flip data also suggests that when you blow up a balloon, sometimes you flip balloon, you see a separation. So we looked at that and found that the people with intermittent separation behave like people with persistent separation, in contrast to people with no separation. So in other words, even having separation for a short period of time during the study seems to be relevant in terms of um, the, the basic metrics that you measure at the EGJ and in terms of acid burden. So a hiatus hernia detected on manometry is reliable and constitutes adjunctive evidence supporting GERD. You cannot make a finite diagnosis of reflux, but you, you, it does support the diagnosis of reflux disease. And uh, um, Roberta touched on this this morning, but sometimes you can stress the situation by having the patient raise their leg and look and see if the increased intra-abdominal pressure that you create when somebody raises the leg off the bed in the supine position bleeds into the thoracic cavity. So if it bleeds into the thoracic cavity, your gradient across the EGJ, and that's part of what Sumit was talking about earlier, your gradient is going to be smaller right, and your intraesophageal pressure is going to be higher. So um, when, when you bleed through to the esophagus through a disrupted EGJ, it seems that that is a association of abnormal acid exposure as measured by acid exposure time. And uh, this is data that was published by uh, Stefano Siboni not too long ago, that an 11 uh, millimeter mercury absolute increase had uh, good performance characteristics or a 78% increase in intraesophageal pressure in predicting abnormal reflux burden in this multi-center study. All right, let's move on and uh, talk a little bit about the esophageal body. And we have these nice metrics through the Chicago classification to quantify esophageal vigor, the contraction vigor in the esophagus, so, and the, the pattern of contraction, right? So you have fragmented, now it's considered ineffective, but if you have a break larger than five centimeters with intact contraction, that's a fragmented swallow, which is now ineffective, and then the, the old ineffective still counts, uh, DCI less than um, 450, but more than 100, and absent when the DCI is less than 100. So the gradient of reflux burden increases through these different patterns of abnormal motility. And so motility, abnormal motility, or hypomotility is associated with increased reflux burden. This was Joan Chen's study. She's sitting right there in the audience um, with Anand Jain as the first uh, author. They demonstrated that bolus clearance is worst when the swallow fails, in contrast to when the swallow is weak. So that was part of the impetus for changing the definition of ineffective esophageal motility to not just rely on weak swallows. You needed to have a heck of a lot of weak swallows for um, 
uh, esophageal bolus um, retention of uh, acid exposure to be abnormal. So this is the old ineffective esophageal motility. It mattered only if you had more than 70% ineffective swallows. And it turns out that these breaks in the contraction sequence w mattered because the breaks allowed bolus or refluxate to be retained. Failed swallows, similarly. So failed just means that the break is so long that you see no contraction. I think that's the way to think about it. So a break, uh, a, a fragmented or an ineffective because of the break is a five centimeter break. A failed swallow is a 10 centimeter break or 15 centimeter break. Both of those can cause bolus retention. And the change in uh, criteria from 3.0 to 4.0 was nicely demonstrated in this study that's actually still in review. You can see that the reflux metrics, the burden of reflux as measured by MNBI and by acid exposure time dip at the fragmented level. This is with 3.0. But if you, if you use 4.0 criteria, you can see a nice progression in reflux burden from normal through IEM to absent contractility, again supporting the notion that the, the worse your uh, esophageal body motor function, the higher your reflux burden. And how does that work? So remember with manometry, you're looking at primary peristalsis. So you're looking at uh, swa uh, swallows that are induced by, uh, I mean, uh, contraction that's induced by swallows. This is work from Harry Chen's group in Taiwan, where they have a special catheter, a special high-resolution manometry catheter with a hole in the middle where, through which they can instill air or acid. They do different kinds of studies with this. This was a study with air installation. And they demonstrated that in patients with IEM, the likelihood of triggering peristalsis with air infusion, which is much lower than in normal volunteers or patients with GERD patients with normal peristalsis. See, in other words, if you imagine that the esophagus is being distended by something, maybe reflux, then that clearance may be impaired in somebody with significant ineffective esophageal motility. So what we're talking about is the volume clearance, the volume clearing wave, which is most often a, a secondary peristaltic wave, may be impaired in patients with ineffective esophageal motility. But then you heard uh, Eduardo talk about the post-reflux swallow-induced peristaltic wave, which is a primary peristaltic wave that brings saliva to the distal esophagus. It turns out that the PSPW index, number of PSPW, as shown very elegantly by the Italians, can um, phenotype reflux. But more importantly, the proportion of PSPWs that you see also follows that same motor pattern in that the worse the motor pattern, the less the likelihood of having an intact PSPW. I know there are problems with it, but this, this demonstrates that there is some relationship there in that you don't trigger as much, <coughs> excuse me, PSPWs if you have hypomotility. <coughs> excuse me, can I, can I have some water? <coughs> and if you were to look at, thank you. all these different metrics in multivariable analysis and see what predicts abnormal reflux. But I get too excited about these things. You see. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that ineffective esophageal motility and the disrupted um, EGJ and absent peristalsis do independently predict acid burden. EGJCI does not. So <clears throat> these are useful elements to consider when you are looking at manometry in the context of reflux disease. Now, contraction reserve, we talked about contraction reserve quite a bit yesterday. I'm not going to go into detail here. But in hypomotility, if you see that the esophagus can augment its contraction when you stress it, that is a situation where your reflux burden may be lower, especially if you do not have IEM as defined by Chicago 4.0. So <clears throat> one uh, uh, last area to touch. The pressure gradient across the EGJ is what uh, IRP measures. The other factors that are important for bolus clearance you see here. But one of the key roles for manometry in GERD is to rule out achalasia. That's the proportion that may have achalasia. <clears throat> now, absent contractility, 
EGG outflow obstruction, these are conditions that may factor in into how you manage reflux disease. And remember that if you have absent contractility, the patient may have achalasia, and it's worth doing additional testing. Now, <clears throat> behavioral syndromes, I'm not going to touch into these um, too much at all, but you can diagnose these with manometry. And that's supergastric belching. This is rumination on um, high-resolution impedance uh, manometry performed with a postprandial protocol. So <clears throat> high-resolution manometry is performed as part of esophageal testing with catheter-based uh, probes. So we should look at it. So it's done in patients anyway. We should look at it. And existing data suggests that EGJ disruption and esophageal body motor function can be associated with higher burden. There are new paradigms and new provocative maneuvers like straight leg arrays that may be uh, now available to interrogate and characterize EGJ. And you may be able to be diagnose these behavioral syndromes, which do not need um, anti-reflux therapy. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. You could survive, my friend. That's a good thing. We are really afraid of I need some Turkish tea. <laughs> <laughs> or, or Turkish coffee. That, 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 that's what lowers the uh, impedance in Turkey. It's, it's kill or cure, really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any question, please? Uh, hello, Prakash. Jenny Myers, Adelaide, Australia. Lovely talk. Really enjoyed that. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about teasing out what we have in Chicago for as the umbrella of ineffective motility. So we've now got patients who have absent pretty much as well as hypo with some fragmentation or low DCI. And particularly in those that have, you've alluded to the fact that there are some people with a hypo motility that have contractile reserve, whether you demonstrate that with the multiple rapid swallow or even a solid or you change your posture and you introduce the rapid drink challenge. And I just wonder if there's the, what your thoughts are about defining that group a little better in terms of those that have capacity for adaptive response versus those who are true hypo, they've got no, no, no good primary peristalsis, they have no ability to have additional secondary peristalsis, they don't respond well, so they don't have that adaptive response, as opposed to those that are not responding all that well to a small volume, but you extend it and challenge it, and therefore they do have intact adaptive reserve. What's your comments? So I think you should start with why you're doing the manometry in the first place, right? If the patient's asymptomatic, why do we care? Yeah, well, that's not necessarily the case because once in a while you'll see it in the context of a manometry being done to rule out something, like, right? So in that context, you don't care. If they have dysphagia, is that enough to explain dysphagia? I don't think we know that yet. And those are the patients where you need adjunctive testing to make sure that the ineffective uh, motility is not part of a, some other picture, because remember, um, weak peristalsis is part of achalasia too, right? So does the patient have an outflow obstruction issue that's causing dysphagia? On the other hand, um, if their symptom is reflux, if their symptom, uh, if the study is being done in the context of reflux, I think we are trying to uh, understand uh, whether when you challenge the patient and the patient is able to recover part of their function, if those patients are going to do better than the people whose function doesn't recover, right? And I think the part of what we have shown before is that the people whose function doesn't recover um, are more prone to having problems later on. These days, we are, we are trying to provoke that response with other means, too. And I think you will see in the future that anybody who can generate a intact looking peristalsis, even if that's in between swallows, that metadata that John was talking about, in between swallows probably will do better than somebody who absolutely does not have any, any contraction. So I think it's worth trying to figure out what else we can do to, f to f identify the people whose uh, peristalsis can be augmented under stress. Thank you very much, Prakash. Now, can you tell, regarding um, the calculation of uh, EGJ-CI uh, 
in uh, esophageal gastric junction type 2, which are the data which induce to include the crural diaphragm? Because I, I'm not sure, sometimes it, it looks yeah. separated, but in yeah. these cases you put it in, yeah. and in type 3, no. Yeah. And uh, could this be a confounder it's in that relationship between yeah. EGJ, CI, and acid exposure? Yeah, it could be a confounder. There, there are two factors at play here. One is the fact that manometry is only accurate to one centimeter, right? So when you say two centimeters, I don't really know what the size of the hernia is, even though uh, it seems like it correlates. Because the, remember, the recording sites are one centimeter apart. Everything else is generated by the computer. The second part is in these small hernias, pressure may compartmentalize between the LES and the crural diaphragm. So there may be pressurization in there, and that can add to the higher EGJCI there. When we've tried to measure the LES only EGJCI in type 2 EGJ, so small hernias of two or more, uh, two or less centimeters. It's very difficult to place those markers there. And that's part of the reason why we take the whole thing. Now, um, in type 3 EGJ, you are, um, you are facilitating success of the metric because you are able to separate the LES. And if the LES is separate from the diaphragm, of course it's going to be weaker. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move to the next uh, presentation. Uh, I'm honored to invite uh, Dr. John Lippem, uh, who will give us a surgical view about classification system and their impact on surgery, fund application, links, and other options. Uh, I'm a <coughs> simple surgeon, so may need some help here. I think you're getting closer. Ah, you got my name on it. I do. All right. Well, um, thank you for the invitation to speak. So I, I am a surgeon, so it's actually pretty unusual that I get really invited to, to much of anything, let alone even dinner at my own house. Um, so I, I was quite excited when Mark uh, sent me an email asking me to come talk about classification systems and their impact on surgery. Am I invited to dinner tonight? <laughs> I am, okay. Okay, all right. Um, so I was a little overzealous and I figured I needed to be efficient in my talk. Last thing I wanna do is run over and be that guy. Um, so I decided to combine my intro slide and the body slides with my conclusion slide. And it was pretty simple. I had a presentation back to Mark within about, I don't know, seven minutes, something like that. And here it is. I was done. And Mark said, well, no, you see, you got to fill the full 20 minutes. And I'm like, I can show vacation photos, you know, us at Legoland. So no, you need to go into this just a little bit deeper. If you don't believe that they're helping surgeons in any way, tell us why and where we can go from here. And so I think there is a need. Um, is really the answer to that, but I don't think we're quite there yet, at least from a surgeon's point of view. You know, for us, classif classification systems need to relate much more to symptomatology. They need to guide us better in treatment, and they need to be tied intimately to outcomes or whatever treatment we decide on. There's many treatments, as you'll hear here in a little bit, for reflux as well as other esophageal problems today, and it seems like every six months we get a new treatment. And again, these classification systems should help determine which treatment is best for which person. Because again, one size doesn't fit all. We're in this era, as John Pandolfino would say, of personalized medicine. Now, as I said a couple seconds ago, surgeons are simple folk. And by the way, for those of you that don't know, we're also very sensitive people that occasionally do need some help. And where we really need help is in predicting dysphagia, as you've heard throughout this course. We also need help in predicting the control of reflux. And we need to, as I said, start to personalize our treatment uh, for reflux as well as other foregut diseases. And so as we've heard for the last two days, I think we're very good at classifying things. And in fact, in just in two days, I think I've come up with, I've heard six other classification systems that I, I was not aware of. I'm not sure on their clinical impact, 
but at least I've got that in my, my fund of knowledge now. I think EGJOO uh, is probably the best example of where we may have gone wrong with our, our zest to classify things. As a surgeon, at least, we hear a new classification, and really what that is is a finding. But to a surgeon, what they hear is, well, that's a diagnosis. And I can tell you, as a surgeon, when you hear a diagnosis, well, we got to intervene. That's what surgeons do. That's what we were built for. All of a sudden, we've got a new diagnosis, and we got to do something about it. And because of that, thousands of patients got myotomies for EGJ, OO. And I can tell you this right now, many of them were not helped by getting that monomony, or myotomy. The finding was maybe due to a hiatal hernia or GERD or opiate use or many other possible scenarios. But again, the surgeon didn't really hear that. All they heard is, we've got a new diagnosis and we've got a treatment for that. Kerry Dunbar recently put together a sort of a synopsis of EGJ outflow obstruction, where we've come from and where we're going. And in this, she even states that up to 90 plus percent of these diagnoses, at least per Chicago 3, kind of resolved on its own. It didn't need any intervention whatsoever. But yet, these patients got myotomy. Now, I think there's been a substantial correction in Chicago 4 by adding symptoms much more into this, as well as the use of confirmatory tests, such as endoflip and time barium. So I think we're on our, on our way. But I would caution about just throwing out a classification um, without the other data. And so manometry is our best example. Uh, good and bad in regards to classifying things. I think we've gotten close to good with achalasia, you know, subtyping it into type 1, type 2, and type 3. Type 3 to me definitely is a different animal. It has different symptoms, and I think there's a mounting body of literature to suggest that POEM is best for patients with type 3 compared to heller myotomy or some of the other treatment options. Now, again, as a simple surgeon, I will tell you, I'm not really sure I understand why we classify type 1 from type 2, because in my simple opinion, you know, it's just progression of disease from type 2 to type 1. Symptoms are roughly the same, and treatment outcomes are roughly the same. IEM, as we already heard, and I will agree adamantly with John, is a horrific diagnosis. It's not helpful at all to us as a surgeon. I mean, I don't know, is this the 95th percentile of contractions? Is there any relation to symptoms when we make this diagnosis? But it has impacted surgery tremendously because surgeons use this as a surrogate for that patient's going to have post-op dysphagia. And so it has altered the surgeon's plan. In addition to that, because of this, every patient that's going to get an intervention for reflux now has to have manometry. Well, that's not really founded in any science whatsoever, as you've heard. But I do want to show you kind of some of that data where this diagnosis doesn't really help us. So it started actually a long time ago. As John said, we've been arguing about this for 25 years. This is one of the original publications by Pellegrini that looked at 74 patients that all had gotten sort of old-fashioned manometry. Then they got Nissen fund application, many of them developed dysphagia, and they looked at the findings on manometry to see if it would predict post-op dysphagia. And lo and behold, it didn't. There was nothing on manometry that predicted post-op dysphagia. It was only pre-op dysphagia. Well, these studies go on and on. Here, to me, is one of the best studies that has ever been done in regards to do I need to tailor my fund application? Do I need to tailor my treatment based on manometry? Um, it was out of the UK, and it was a prospective randomized trial where they did pre-op manometry on everybody, 127 patients. They classified them in either effective or ineffective. And then from there, they were randomized, irregardless of their manometry findings, to get a Nissen or a toupee. They had them come back in a year and assess their dysphagia. Well, indeed, a Nissen fund application does have more dysphagia than a partial or toupee fund application. There was no difference in GERD control or anything else, but a mild difference in dysphagia rates. When they then looked at ineffective versus effective, irregardless of the type of fund application, there was no difference in dysphagia. So again, this idea to tailor the fund application is not founded 
in science or data. Well, if you don't remember history, what, you're going to step in it again, whatever the saying was? Well, we, with links, decided, well, there must be something more important with links in regards to manometry. So myself and a group of other surgeons got together and put together 105 patients that we had with ineffective esophageal motility that got links and compared that to 105 patients with matched controls looking for predictors of dysphagia with links. IEM was defined at that time as DCI less than 450, less than 50% paracelsus. They all had similar pre-op dysphagia rates. And it looks like they shot this piece of paper with a shotgun because there was no difference between the patients with ineffective esophageal motility and normal motility in regards to dysphagia. There was no difference in dilation rates. There was no difference in explant rates. Again, the only predictor of post-op dysphagia was pre-op dysphagia. Smaller links devices seemed to factor in. And then weirdly enough, peristalsis under 40% did seem to foreshadow more dysphagia in these patients. This was followed up by uh, Blair Job's group where he looked at his own data of 380 patients um, and looked at the ones with persistent dysphagia to see if manometry would help predict this. Again, manometry really didn't help much. Small hernias seem to have more dysphagia. Pre-op dysphagia again falls out. And then in his study, for unclear reasons, peristalsis under 80% seemed to uh, put you at a higher risk for dysphagia. DCI, mean DEA, did not predict dysphagia. And so for it to be a classification system for us, to help us anyway, it should help us predict dysphagia. Now, I know prediction is always difficult, but a finding of IEM should have clinical relevance. And right now, I don't think that it does. Now, maybe we didn't need different thresholds on manometry. Maybe we need to combine it with endoflip or some other tools. Or maybe we combine diagnostics and clinical data, not just preoperative clinical data, but what the surgeons experience post-op. And so we've started to do that in regards to links. Because links is really, or dysphagia is really the problem portion of links, if you're not familiar with it. And so we started to look at our own data, and this was presented at DDW. We haven't presented it yet because we're, gonna add, we're adding some other variables, and we're also comparing it to a fundo group. But it's our own experience at USC where we looked at 875 Lynx patients. We had about a 5% removal rate, all for bad dysphagia. And we started to look at characteristics that were associated on multivariate analysis with a higher incidence of dysphagia needing removal. And what we found is the young patients that tend to be a little squirrelier didn't do as well. Older patients, for probably clear reasons, didn't. Uh, female patients had a little higher incidence. Peristalsis, again, fell out with under 40%. But what really fell out, highlighted in green, which put patients at about a tenfold risk of dysphagia and removal, were patients with autoimmune disease. In fact, almost any autoimmune disease led to a much higher removal rate and dysphagia. Psychiatric anxiety meds, for, obviously re for obvious reasons, also led to a higher dysphagia rate. Pre-op dysphagia again falls out and smaller link sizes. Now, we've also used this same data set. We have a fund application data set with the same variables. And I will tell you, at least on preliminary analysis, almost all of this falls out with them also, with the exception, obviously, of the smaller link sizes. And so that's number one. That's where we need the most help is with dysphagia. But I think the other area we need help is predicting reflux control and which procedure is, will work better for each patient. Now, pH testing is fantastic, but it's not a dichotomous variable. You know, Demestra score of 15 is not the same as 40. I will argue that one out of four days on Bravo testing is not the same as four out of four days. As a surgeon, I can tell you that the, the change in quality of life or the happiness of the patient is directly related to how many days they're positive and patients with Demeester scores over 30. Now again, as I said, one treatment doesn't work for all patients. We need help trying to determine which treatment works for which patient. And we've been looking for this for years. All procedures are definitely not created equal. 
The Nissen fund application still seems to have a role in the treatment of this disease, but I think it is, it is only applicable for patients with severe disease. And this isn't new data. Uh, we've known this for a while, that patients with severe disease do better with Nissen fund application. In fact, Reg Bell published this some 25 years ago, where he looked at the results of two-pay fund application in patients with severe disease. He defined that as patients with complicated esophagitis as well as a defective LES by length and pressure on manometry, and found that the failure rate of a partial fund application in a severe GERD patient was 50% at three years, compared to 96% success in the mild to moderate reflux. So we do know we need to tailor the operation based on severity of disease. And so we started to look at favorable predictors of outcome with links. This is from Blair Job's group again that started to look at who does best with links compared to fund application. He looked at 500 and some odd patients. He defined favorable outcome as being off the PPIs, greater than 50% improvement in symptom scores. He did multivariate regression analysis and the usual suspects fell out. Uh, patients under the age of 45 did a little bit better. Males did a little bit better. The more symptomatic you were, the better you did. And the higher the Demeester scores, the better the patients did. Um, we took it from a different angle at USC, and we also presented this at DDW recently. We looked at predictors of a poor outcome with links. And here what we found um, were the patients with severe reflux, patients with long segment Barrett's, patients with LA grade D esophagitis and Demeester scores greater than 80 did not do well with links. They did not get good reflux control and these patients did better with Nissen. And so I think we have an opportunity here to partner, you know, GI and surgery um, to get closer to this idea of personalized medicine. Because I think we need to combine diagnostics with all the clinical data we have to develop classification systems that guide treatment. And I think the GIs can help in many ways, especially determining who's not a good candidate, which surgeons are not all that good at. And surgeons, I think, can help identify who is a good candidate. We do see the patients that are super happy, and I can almost tell you preoperatively which ones they will be. And it's not always straightforward, and you've heard a lot today about sort of these three categories of the GERD patient. A GERD patient is not the same as the other GERD patient. And there's definitely three types or three groups of these patients. And I think the sexy term for this is the pandolfino phenotypes. It doesn't really roll off your tongue and it's a little sophisticated for us surgeons, so I've renamed it into a sort of a non-sexy term, which I call the Lipham's beer buckets. This is easier to kind of grasp once I fully explain this, but there are still three buckets here. There's that hypersensitive bucket, there's the middle group, and then there's this big change in quality of life group. The hypersensitive ones, I mean, we all know what those are. The bottom line is there, as you can see from the fancy diagram, is there's no beer in the bucket, right? These patients don't have reflux. They're zero or at most one day positive on their Bravo pH testing. This is physiologic reflux. They're hypersensitive at best, but I can tell you as a surgeon, these are the patients that come into my office that are dying. They are dying of their reflux, and as a surgeon, you're tempted to operate on them. These are the worst possible outcomes a surgeon can have, and I think GIs are very beneficial here in help identifying them and treating them. Now, the best bucket of all, the mother load of beer, as I will call it, are these patients here, the big change in quality of life. These are the happiest patients. These are the best candidates for any intervention. They're three to four days positive on Bravo pH testing. They've got bigger hernias. They've got esophagitis or Barrett's. As you heard before, they've got regurgitative symptoms. They've got okay manometry findings. They're psychosocial stable, which I don't think we put enough emphasis on, um, and they don't have pre-op dysphagia. The most difficult group in this is this middle group. And here's where that bucket may have beer or it may have a wine cooler. This is one of my favorite algorithms up here. Now we don't have time to go through the whole algorithm, but if you start on the top left where it says start, and you follow it all the way down, this is that group. Because all the way at the bottom right, every path takes you to perform autopsy. <laughs> this is how I really feel about this group. 
These are the patients that tend to be one to two days positive on their Bravo pH testing. And here, I think we've got to balance many factors from severity of reflux to symptom correlation, whether it's typical or atypical, LPR, hiatal hernias, psychosocial stuff, responsive meds. I mean, the list goes on and on. This is the difficult group. This is the group we need help with. But let's be honest, nobody really cares about my buckets. Um, but I think you know some of these collaborative societies such as AFS and EFS, as well as this conference here where there are a fair number of surgeons, I think is a step in the right direction. We've got many alternatives to fundoplication from LINX to TIF to now the reflux stop. But I will tell you that not every patient needs surgery. And this is a surgeon telling you this at a GI conference. But not every patient needs PPIs either. I think there's a compromise here and we need to start to identify who's best for which treatment. And so the classification systems to me going forward need to move more towards personalized medicine. I think we need to focus on clinical symptoms, outcomes that help guide treatment. And so with that, I will shut up. Any question? Great presentation. Um, I'm just wondering if you can talk to the group of failed fund application, both in terms of what would drive you to reoperate in terms of investigations and your selection of operations after failure and you know, perhaps taking us through links or fundos generally. What, what do you do the second time around? How do you select which patients you would operate on again? Yeah, I mean, it really, at the end of the day, it comes down to, to symptoms and generally hernia size. Um, the, number, the number one reason by far that anti-reflux surgery fails is recurrence of the hiatal hernia. In fact, it's over 90%. The reason for that is a little complicated. It's a whole nother lecture, but it basically comes down to a, a structural issue probably centered around collagen that they're defective in. And so the patients that we'll choose to operate on are the patients that are more like that mother load bucket where they're very symptomatic, they have a lot of regurgitative symptoms, and they're for me anyway, I usually will just redo the hiatal hernia repair and do nothing else. I will tell you this right now, fund applications don't come undone. They don't unwrap and reattach themselves to the spleen. The failure rate of anti-reflux procedures is recurrence of that hiatal hernia. So if we go in that second time, most of us will put some form of mesh to try to get that cura to stay together. And, uh, the, and to, to answer the other side of the question, and um, with dysphagia, um, what investigations do you order or turn it around? What would prompt you to go in and uh, do some more surgery and someone coming back to you with swallowing problems? Well, I mean, I think the best thing, and it gets back to something John said earlier, was, you know, whether or not this is a sur surgical complication or whether this is that patient's healing response to surgery. So we see, just as everybody else, a bell-shaped curve when it comes to that inflammatory response and healing. And many of these patients, not all, I admit, but many of them, their problem is excessive scarring around the esophagus and the hiatus from their reaction to trauma. And so we've gone to basically doing endoflip to look at that DI there. Um, and if the DI is very low, our first step is we're going to try dilating it, and we can salvage quite a bit but not all. Some we need to go in there and either undo the fund application or usually the culprit is scarring around the hiatus and we need to open that up. Yeah, I think we should stop here so far. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, just before the Prosecco, we can move to the pet panel discussion, faculty discussion, starting with Prakash again. We'll take the questions after both our talks. Okay. He's saying that we are going to take the questions after both talks. He drank a cup of Turkish coffee and ready for the talk. Yeah, hopefully so. So um, this session is meant to be, or th this part of the evening is meant to be us critiquing the Lyon Consensus, right? Us critiquing the Lyon Consensus 1. So that's essentially what we are terming Lyon Consensus 2. So this was the original Lyon Consensus. So. Um, the sheep with the bucket is the bottom row. The I can't remember what the what the good category was. That's the top row. 
and then the, the wine cooler or beer with these categories here in between. But we, we received a lot of pushback with LA grade B, right? We received a lot of pushback, Leon won, by putting LA grade B in that borderline or inconclusive category. And indeed, everybody who critiqued us was right. So this is the LA grade, uh, grades of esophagitis. And if you go back and look at the original data from the 90s, uh, where they validated the um, LA grades, LA grade B had decent acid exposure. Everybody had acid exposure here, but LA grade B had decent acid exposure time and decent numbers of reflux episodes, what we would consider pathologic at this time. And I'm going to show a couple of studies. Uh, this was done um, in Italy, and you can see here that LA grade A, B, and C were compared in terms of pH impedance monitoring off PPI. It wasn't ethical to do LA grade D, so pH impedance. Um, and using Lyon consensus criteria, Every single one of uh, LA grade B had abnormal reflux burden, every single one of them. The median acid exposure time was significantly higher in LA grade B compared to LA grade A, and the PPI response for LA grade B was similar to LA grade C esophagitis. Now, this is uh, older data from Arian's group, and if you go back and look at this, you can see that the horizontal line is the um, AT6 um, threshold. Uh, I don't think you can see my pointer there, but most of LA grade B is above that line. And this is data from RUSU from, uh, from last year. Again, if you look at the box and whiskers and the dotted lines, most of B is above that. So LA grade B esophagitis provides conclusive objective evidence of GERD, and, you, and if it's done in an in a, in a experienced fashion, that you're actually seeing LA grade B and not calling LA grade A LA grade B, you're, you're pretty good about confidence level in that the patient's going to have abnormal reflux burden, not LA grade A. All right, what else? Let, uh, we've already touched on the, the thresholds for um, wireless pH monitoring, and because of the day-to-day -day variation, the, the original Leon did not break down um, pH impedance versus um, wireless, right? It did not break down the thresholds for pH impedance ver versus wireless. And it turns out that with wireless monitoring, looking at uh, each day data, uh, you, you get augmented diagnosis or augmented e evidence for elevated acid exposure the longer you record. Also, any one day does not predict the overall study. So uh, most patients with day one that was abnormal had a dominant uh, pathologic pattern, but not everyone. And um, uh, most patients with day one physiologic had uh, a physiologic pattern, but not everyone. So you cannot hinge your diagnosis based on one good day or one bad day. You have to look at the full picture. And this is the information from the 48-hour study. The, the green um, bar on the um, right-hand side, no, on the left-hand side, tells you the proportion of patients who had discordant day one and day two in a 48-hour study. And like I said earlier, when you add day three, you can get most of them uh, classified or uh, identified as dominant pathologic versus uh, physiologic. I've already shown this. I'm not going to go through this again, but this was again um, uh, showing that uh, patients uh, who had uh, PPI non-responsive persistent, persistent symptoms could be categorized into those who can uh, go off their PPI versus those who need PPI based on the four-day study. <clears throat> And I showed this earlier, too, that you can break down uh, patients uh, who have a dominant physiologic or a dominant pathologic pattern based on the four-day data. And you can actually plan how you're going to manage them using this very nice uh, trajectory assessment that Raina did a few years ago based on the number of days that you had abnormal acid burden. This is part of what John was saying, that if you have four days of abnormal study, those are the ones that are going to respond the best. So overall, in 2023, a 96-hour study is preferred if you're going to do wireless. 
and uh, acid exposure time less than four, all four days is physiologic, uh, more than six and more than two days is pathologic. All other patterns are inconclusive. You're going to need additional information. Now, this particular study has also been shown before. This is um, uh, pH impedance on PPI um, in patients who had proven GERD treated with BID PPI and then had a pH impedance study regardless of whether they were better or not. We had a European heartburn predominant cohort and a North American regurgitation predominant cohort. And if you looked at predictors for persisting symptoms, um, more than 40 reflux episodes, you see the performance characteristics, and acid exposure time, the threshold for continuing symptoms was 0.5. We thought that was a little low. But even when you use these thresholds and moved patients who were abnormal, or at least patients who had persisting symptoms who went to anti-reflux surgery, we had a pretty dis decent response, especially for regurgitation. But if you use the more stringent threshold, acid exposure time more than four, more than 80 reflux episodes of MNBI less than 1,500 on BID PPI in patients with known reflux were studied on BID PPI, your response to escalating care to surgery was 85 percent. In fact, um, an older study from 2005 from Mike Vasey's group where they had done pH studies on PPI, catheter-based pH studies on PPI, in patients who are symptomatic but not necessarily proven GERD, they came up with these thresholds. Median um, acid exposure time for about 1% on once a day, 0.3% on BID, which is about point, similar to what we got, which is 0.5 uh, on BID. And you can see the 75th percentile value. So in patients with proven GERD, ambulatory reflux monitoring on PPI can be useful, and the thresholds that are relevant are probably going to be acid exposure time more than four, more than 80 reflux episodes. You probably need combinations in this MNBI less than 1,500. Now, finally, uh, we've heard a little bit about mucosal impedance being able to create these heat maps that differentiate um, normal from GERD and from EOE. And looking at the, the pattern of uh, baseline impedance, you can segregate these groups out from maybe from patients who don't have reflux. But the problem with this is that if you look at the ROC curves, and many people have shown these images before, this technology performs the worst for people with reflux does well to exclude patients with true GERD and to identify patients with EOE. So mucosal impedance methodology using the balloon or the cap, not ready for prime time to tell you whether somebody has conclusive GERD, may be useful to rule out GERD. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop LA grade B, conclusive evidence, day-to-day -day, uh, interpretation, and then monitoring on PPI, you see the evidence there. Thank you. Well, as uh, Prakash said, this is a critics of the Leon one. And this is what I'm going to do. Um, don't worry, I'm, I'm not going to destroy it, but we are going to discuss some of the points of, of Leon one. Uh, how can I get the full screen? Slides, slides here at the top. Can I just have it? Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I will do something like the similar to what Prakash did, and I will discuss three different issues that were considered useful as adjunctive or supportive evidence for diagnosis of reflux. One is the use of the histopathology, uh, electron microscopy to identify dilated intercellular spaces. Then I will discuss the issue of the number of reflux episodes, more than 80. And finally, I will discuss whether we are at this moment able to use the low MNBI and 
low PSPW um, as adjunctive measures. The endoscopy findings in patients not responding to PPIs are described in this slide, and you can see that 58% of the patients have normal endoscopy, and very small percentage are described with other diagnoses. Now, the question is whether it is useful to get a biopsy in these patients. Um, and it requires experienced pathologists in your hospital. It is expensive, and um, it is more probably useful as a research tool than as a clinical tool. This is how a hematoxylene eosin biopsy looks like, with a thin basal layer and a small papilla. And this is how a NERD patient biopsy looks like, with a um, thicker basal layer, a larger papilla, and this has been used um, to use uh, to, to form a um, score, considering the basal cell hyperplasia, the papillary elongation and dilated intercellular spaces, and that score uh, distinguished somehow controls for from patients with uh, hypersensitive esophagus, NERD, and erosive disease. I think that this is a very interesting distinction. However, still 15% of healthy subjects might have um, abnormalities in the hematoxylin eosin biopsy. So it's not 100% accurate, and you need uh, experienced pathologist in your hospital. On top of that, there is a possibility to identify dilated intercellular spaces, which was considered in the last I would say five years ago or 10 years ago, the marker of non-erosive reflux disease, including me. So this is a study from Marcelo Vela showing that controls have a much smaller dilation of the intercellular spaces, whereas patients with GERD have more. Um, now, the problem is, what is the relevance of the dilated intercellular spaces in perception of reflux symptoms? We thought, as most of you probably, that if you have an increased permeability in the mucosa, there will be entrance of luminal substances that will activate the nerves, and we will perceive pain. So we looked at the innervation of the mucosa in healthy subjects and in patients with reflux disease, and we found two patterns. Very distal innervation or very superficial innervation. And we found that the patients with NERD, with hypersensitivity, have much more superficial innervation. Now, what is the relevance of this relative to dilated intercellular spaces. And the point is that when you look at the dilated intercellular spaces, they are pretty deep in the mucosa. And the nerves are there, but much more superficial. So it doesn't matter whether you have or not dilated intercellular spaces very deep in the mucosa because the nerves are much more superficial, and they are activated regardless of whether or not you have dilated intercellular spaces. And I think that this is a novel concept that uh, changed our way to see this parameter that we had for several years. Finally, there was a very interesting study from the um, Amsterdam group looking at the utility of esophageal biopsies in patients with refractory reflux symptoms, and they looked at 300 patients that were PPI refractory. Uh, it was a prospective study, and the aim was to see what is the diagnostic yale of esophageal biopsies um, and the clinical factors associated with EOE. And 
surprising to me, because I thought that biopsies were much more useful, um, they say that um, the diagnostic yield in patients with refractory reflux symptoms is very low, 4.7%. And uh, the diagnosis of EOE in these patients is also low unless you look at the patients only with dysphagia. So their conclusion is that, in fact, in the clinical setting, not in the research setting, the biopsy during the endoscopy uh, that is performed initially does not have a very high yield to confirm the diagnosis of conclusive uh, reflux disease. Let's discuss the issue of the number of reflux episodes that today was mentioned several times uh, by different speakers. I agree that if you have many reflux episodes, that means that there is many times a failure of the anti-reflux barrier. And therefore, if there are many failures of the anti-reflux barrier, you have a problem. The point is that the number of reflux episodes can be um, artificially increased by other phenomena, behavioral phenomena. For example, this is a situation where the patients have a lot of regurgitation reflux episode postprandial, and the patient doesn't have reflux disease. He has rumination. Now, you can ask me, is this a reflux episode or is a rumination episode? Well, to me, it's a rumination episode that will be corrected by specific treatment for rumination rather than a, a fundoplication or a lynx. This is a very typical pattern that we describe in patients with postprandial repetitive room, uh, regurgitations not responding to PPIs that happen to have, in fact, a rumination syndrome. And it is much more common than what we suspected. You can see that this is the end of the meal period, and the patient has a lot of liquid non-acidic regurgitations. Not only there is a number, but also most of them are symptomatic. So the patient is pushing the event marker at the time that he is regurgitating. And this is also very interesting, the time delay from the occurrence of the regurgitation and the pushing of the event marker. This is hypervigilance. In general, the patients push several seconds after the phenomenon. This patient pushed while they are regurgitating. You can see in the tracing, this patient is pushing the marker at the same time that he is doing it, suggesting that he is very conscious of what he's doing and is a kind of um, um, conscious activity. So this is a pattern typical of rumination observed during MIIPH measurements. Of course, this will modify the number of reflux episodes. If you don't look at this with attention, this subject will have definitely more than 80 reflux episodes. Will you send him to surgery because of that? And you mentioned today that that was a factor that was um, predicting the result of patients with predominant rumination, a predominant regurgitation, links treatment for predominant regurgitation, if they had more than 80. And I tell you now that if the patient has rumination, the treatment is not a lynx. Therefore, it is very important when you look at the number of reflux episodes to identify rumination events to make sure that you are not mixing the two things. Another al alternative problem when you count the number of reflux episodes is the occurrence of supragastric belching. Patients with supragastric belching, they have both. They have the belches, and they push the marker in a very happy way. And you can see here, when I open a tracing and I see lots of event markers, to me, the first diagnosis is supragastric belching without any analysis, like this. Now, of course, if you are not used to this, you will count the number of reflux episodes associated to 
uh, supragastric bilges, and you see this haptic 116. But is this a patient with increased reflux, num num number of reflux episodes, or is a patient with a behavioral disorder that uh, is producing supragastric belch related reflux episodes? Is this a finding that prompts you to send the patient to anti-reflux surgery? No. This patient needs cognitive behavioral therapy to reduce the behavioral disorder, which is supragastric belching. So my comment on this concerning the Lyon consensus is that, OK, more than 80 episodes should be an adjunctive measurement, but please have a careful look at your tracing and know what the patient is doing and make sure that this is not a ruminator and this is not a belcher. And once you are sure, send him to Dr. Lipman. He, he will do a, a very nice um, links. This is an example of the reflux episodes associated with the supragastric belches. They, have, they are reflux episodes. I'm not saying that they are not. The pH drops. There is liquid coming up. But this is belch-induced reflux. So the treatment is not the treatment of reflux. Is the treatment of the belch. And finally, I wanted to discuss as adjunctive measures of um, the finding of low MNBI and low PSPW scores. And I already discussed this uh, the other day. The problem is the cutoff values that, we, that are published, and I think that we need to change them. And I think that in the Lyon 2 should be discussed and described new cutoff values for this. Um, these are the MNBI and the PSPW. Um, concerning the basal impedance, uh, we know now that the basal impedance is low in patients with erosive disease. It's lower in patients with NERD compared to functional heartburn. And the cutoff value proposed in the literature by the Italian group is 2,292. And according to our data in health, is, and, and with this, the the sensitivity uh, is 52%, and the uh, specificity is 86%. So with our new um, data of um, uh, normal values, the, the cutoff for MNBI is much lower. It is 1,500 rather than 2,500. Likewise, the PSPW index had been described with a cutoff value of 61%. So you have a normal subject has 61%, less than 61% is pathological. And even it was described that this has a, a outcome prediction value. Um, I think that this is too high, that many healthy subjects have much lower um, uh, PSPW than that. Um, and uh, I show you already this, that the cutoff values for MNBI is around 1,500. And the cutoff values for PSPW, I must say that I don't know. I think that they are very low, much less than 61%. And we cannot include that into the adjunctive measures of um, the Lyon II consensus. Um, so I discussed with you in a critical way these measures for the next Lyon consensus. I think that it's, it's better to acknowledge the errors than to ignore them. And this is what we are trying to do today. Thank you very much. Any questions, any comments? I guess I, I'd just like to ask uh, in general terms. Um, I, mean, I feel, as a comment, that this approach, however, is a very helpful approach. The, I think we all, almost all of us would accept that there's no one investigation that gives us all the answers. And so we, just like any other part of clinical medicine, we should continue collecting information until we have the answer. And if it's true for conventional GERD, it's definitely true for extraesophageal GERD. And um, so, you know, I was delighted when you came, uh, not, presumably not quite alone, but when you sort of presented this concept, do you think yourself that it stood the test of validation studies and in general terms? I think with some caveats, um, you showed information about how often 
the paper was downloaded. So clearly, people are looking at it. Well, it's, it's been cited nearly yeah. 800 times. So clearly, clearly, the idea, and remember, that was part of what you had proposed, the whole idea of having these gray areas, conclusive versus inconclusive, and that was part of how Chicago classification was developed. So it seems like that concept is working, but we need to keep uh, you know, doing our research and looking at outcomes to figure out where these thresholds should be. I don't think that's perfect yet. So I know you're developing a relatively rapid pr uh, process to version two. Um, you've already said that you're going to put esophagitis grade B into the conclusive diagnosis box. Are you going to change the uh, acid exposure time? Are you going to alter anything else that's on that list up there? Uh, for the most part, you'll have to wait and see. But I think um, the uh, wireless will come in there and uh, the on PPI information. I think that's, that's going to be the most uh, uh, overwhelming difference. When you say on PPI, in what sense? I mean, you're not going to say that we should be doing all tests on PPI? No, no. no. the thresholds on PPI. The thresholds on PPI. With the same idea. Go what is conclusive on BID PPI? And it will be very clear that you should be doing on PPI studies only in proven GERD. Thank you. I would like to make a question to the, my friends here, which is a problem that I have. One can define a cutoff value based on normal asymptomatic subjects. You look at the median, you look at the 95, 5 percentile, and you say, okay, what, whatever is outside the 95 or the, nine, or the 5 percentile is abnormal, and then you use it for a diagnostic <coughs> tool. But alternatively, and this is what has been done with the MNBI and the PSPW, you can create a rock curve and you define the sensitivity and specificity that distinguishes a patient with a certain pathology from patients that are not fulfilling the complete diagnostic criteria for that pathology. And this is what, was, what has been done with the definition of certain cutoff values. So I must say that I, I struggle to, to be sure that the best way is to use normal subjects rather than the rock curve that distinguish two uh, different pathologies. Um, I must say that we discussed this several times, um, and um, I'm still um, doubting. So. Can I ask you, who votes for normal subjects? There are caveats to this. It depends what you're trying to show, but yes. OK. And of course, who votes for a rock curve? So it's very similar percentage. So. But they're doing different things, Daniel, yeah. as I'm sure you'd uh, agree. Well, this is what I don't know. Well, you want to, you, you, there is, of course, a, a part of us that wants just to be quite clear that we're dealing with pathology. But, uh, and that is where you need your normal controls and you need to show that there's no overlap between the findings in health and in disease. And in Chicago, we tended towards the, not just the two standard deviations, but the three standard deviations because we recognize to use this overused phrase, the ineffective motility is so common. Also in normal people, you really have to push the threshold out to the pathological end before it means anything at all. And uh, which is of course where Dr. Lippham comes in. And, but the rock curve is much better if you're trying to choose outcomes. So in, in, in uh, Eduardo's studies, and he'll talk for himself, it's more about outcome. And of course, outcome studies are surely also important. Yes, indeed. Uh, it's impossible to compare the normal values we measure with from LT volunteers with those we uh, provided in our studies because as a reference standard, standard in our study was the response to PPI. So we measure using the rock curve according to a positive response to PPI. And so far we had the 2020 
200 for MMBI and 61 percentage for PSPW. Why with uh, the normal values we measured, we set with the fifth percentile value for uh, for uh, PSPW and MMBA. So there are totally different. It, it's like comparing apple and pear. But anyway, that's fine. And uh, um, I have another. I have a comment, if possible, Daniel, about uh, what you suggested suggested about histopathology. I agree that uh, it, it is not cost effectiveness to do uh, biopsies in all patients with the refractory GERD and so on, but 5% uh, of patients out of 300 having eosinophilic esophagitis is a small number, but it's 20 people who have a diagnosis of their symptoms. So, But probably those patients will have the diagnosis just with endoscopy without the need of the biopsy. No, no, they were endoscopy negative. Ah, I see. Okay. I mean, of course, the perfect, before we go to the question up there, the perfect metric would be one that both distinguishes between health and disease and predicted outcome. But that's why we, um, but that doesn't exist, which is why we have that. Thank you. There's a question all the way back. Salvatore Tolone, Italy. Uh, Prakash Daniel, great talk. Um, Prakash, moving uh, the esophagitis grade B in uh, the upper box, in uh, the paradise, or I don't know if it's the L. Um, from a surgical standpoint of view, uh, could I now indicate anti-reflux surgery only with endoscopy and performing a manometry to exclude a major esophageal motility disorder? I will always do also a pH monitoring but uh, uh, I have some concern for uh, the clinical practice, the future clinical practice. And if I may, Daniel, uh, do we need also normative values for pH monitoring, uh, uh, also for overweight and obese patients? Thank you. Well, I think that this is a very good question. The, the patients with overweight have a lower MNBI. There is a problem in the mucosa in obese patients. So when you look at the permeability of the esophageal mucosa from biopsies from obese patients, they have more permeability and the MNBI is lower. Uh, it, it, does it mean that these patients have more reflux? Probably yes. So I don't think that we need to modify very much the, the, the cutoff in that way. Uh, can I ask Rena, why do you think that the rock curve is better than the normal subjects? I ask you because I know that you are an expert in these kind of problems. Oh. Well, GERD is in my mind, a symptom-based disorder, right? It's different from hyperlipidemia or other conditions which are very much based on thresholds. And uh, hyperlipidemia, we put a statin on if the LDL is a certain level. But for GERD, it's a symptom-based disorder. And so we want to guide the treatment to improve the symptoms. And so in those cases, forming it based on outcomes, um, is more reasonable. Now, if you're developing your physiologic thresholds using the normative data, it is, is the way to go. But I think for pathologic levels, basing it on outcomes for that reason. See, I would agree with that because that was what I was going to comment about these, uh, these thresholds. And the two, they serve two purposes. On the, on, the, on the one side, they serve to, um, for, for a physician to be able to tell a patient that your symptom does not need management like you would if it was very high, right? So that, if the values are within the normal threshold, you're going to treat them differently. <laughs> but on the other, other hand, if they have values uh, that predict outcome with a certain type of management, that's the upper limit of normal, and then you'd, you'd, you'd do that. But I think uh, in, in response to uh, Salvatore's question, I don't think the uh, Lyon consensus uh, figure is meant to tell you how to treat your patient. I think you have to go back to the patient. And if you go back to the patient, the more information you have about what's going on, 